All right, so today we are looking at a topic, you know, called uh, the worldviews. Maybe I should have said Christianity versus worldview or what Christianity and worldview. So this worldview is something, uh, I'm not an expert in it, but uh, it's something I didn't know so much about. And then when I knew about it, I decided to know more about it. So I did some research and uh, it's from the research I've done that I'm going to share with us today because it's a very interesting topic. And uh, it's a topic that's uh, going to help us to put things in perspective and to also understand other people from their perspective. You know, it's also going to help us relate with other people in a very multicultural and diverse uh, world that we have been in now. I pray that the Lord will uh, speak to us, speak to me too, speak through me, so that uh, we understand our environment better. All right. So, as when we talk about worldview, you see that Pharisees and the Sadducees, they both worship in the synagogue, the same synagogue, okay? But the, the um, Pharisees, they believe in angels, <laughs> but the Sadducees, they do not believe in angels, yet they worship in the same synagogue. So what is the issue? It's perspective, right? Perspective. They are in the same environment, they are in the same synagogue, but they see things differently, you know. So we, we see the same thing, but we perceive different things, you know. We perceive different things, though we are seeing the same thing. Like the time I wanted to do a T-shirt for the uh, association, some people were like, oh, <laughs> this color is better. Some say this color is better. We are seeing the same thing, but different perception and our definition of of, of what is uh, what is good or what is uh, beautiful or what is not beautiful as the case may be all right so this is a picture okay picture of a crocodile and a fish in the mouth <laughs> so the in this illustration if you ask three different people okay what's going on here it's just an illustration one will say the fish is in trouble Okay, the fish is in trouble. The the uh, crocodile is about to kill the fish. Another person will interpret it. They are saying the same thing. Oh, that the fish is uh, is about to drown. That the crocodile just came to rescue it, so that it will not drown. <laughs> Another person will say, Oh, they are neighbors. They live in the same place. They both live in that water there. So they are just playing. They are just playing together. Nothing is up. It's not journey and there is no trouble. Okay. So I gave this illustration to somebody recently and I gave this person the three uh, stuff and the person came up with her own. He said, The first question we should ask ourselves Do crocodiles eat fish? <laughs> so she gave a philosophical answer to a picture that is very simple. What is going on? And she was giving a philosophical answer. What is the problem? It's an issue of interpretation. Okay? So our perception influences our interpretation. Praise the Lord. So as the saying goes, every man's perception is his reality. It is the way you perceive something that, that you will dis define things. Okay? However, though uh, we all have our perception, our perception also uh, can be wrong. Yes, it can be wrong. And we'll see the reason why our perception can be wrong. So a lot of us must have seen this uh, picture before. Okay. So if you saw the first picture, if you saw the first picture, you will, you, you will just assume that uh, the Communist Party had it again. But until you see the second picture, before you will see that, oh, this thing is real. So as we begin to look at worldview, we begin to see where the different worldview are focusing on. And what we as Christians, which kind of worldview do we need to have to be able to see things in full as, as this? And I pray God will help us in Jesus' name. So the reason why our perception can be wrong is that 
is because we have a right to our perception, but our perception, but we do not have rights to the fact. So if I see this first picture, I have the right to say, ah, it's the Communist Party that is killing children. Okay? But that perception have the right to be wrong. I have to be objective enough to realize that. Because I, by the time I now have a di different perception and see things from a different place, I will now see the whole fact. Because what I have before is just a fact, but the whole truth is in picture two. Praise the Lord. Okay? So... Let's look at the prodigal son. The prodigal son to also illustrate this idea of perspective. Okay. So, um, Luke 15 from 11 to 20. And Jesus was speaking here. See, to illustrate the point further, Jesus told them this story. A man has two sons. The younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die praise the lord before you die this is very important because normally you share your estate when you are dead not before you die but this guy is coming with his own philosophical perspective and there are people who we also have the similar perspective with him as a matter of fact i've heard somebody said we agree okay that the prodigal son wasted his resources. But is it not good that he knew his right? That he has a right to his father's wealth? Ah! Praise the Lord. Perspective. So this is his own perspective. This is his own worldview. He felt that he has right to his father's assets, why the uh, father's estate, why the father was still alive. So this is an issue of uh, for or against. So when you put this out there, some people will say he is right, some will say it is wrong. You know, but it depends on where you are looking at the thing from. Then the next place, so his father agreed to divide his wealth with between his sons. So take note of the agree. Just because somebody said something, you agree, doesn't mean uh, you 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 accept. Doesn't mean you believe what the person is doing. Okay. So most times, we are unable to really disagree with people and still accept the people. And as we begin to look at what view, we'll begin to see the possibility of agreeing with somebody just to let things go, not because uh, you believe what the person is saying. I don't think there's nothing here that said that the father accepted or uh, believed in what the prodigal son was suggesting. All right, so verse 30 says, After a few days later, this young son packed all his belongings and moved to a distant land. And there he wasted all his money in wide living. <laughs> so you see, number one thing we need to see is that what was his motive for looking for the estate of his father? The motive is simple. He wanted to live a wide life. We can see it here. He wanted to live a wide life. That's why he was propounding this theory. That's why he was holding on to this worldview. Ah, may God help us in Jesus' name. There are a lot of people today who don't want God to exist because, not because they don't, there is no evidence to show that God exists, but because of the kind of life they want to live. Praise the Lord. <laughs> a lot of people are saying no to a lot of things and denying the fact, denying the evidence of the power of God because of the kind of life they want to live. And the father, I believe, understood this. That's the reason why the father didn't bother to argue with the son. He just agreed to let it go. So the Bible, the Bible says he wasted all his money in wide living. So what you want sometimes can direct your perspective. Verse 14. See, about the time his money ran out, a great farmer swept over the land and he began to starve. Now, I want us to take note of these two things. First of all, his money ran out. Secondly, there was famine all over the place. Apart from him not having money, there was the economy was bad. So he was starving. But if we, before we go any further, if we come up here, you will see that uh, here he was living well. You know, look at it. He's wet. He's wet. So the father was wealthy. So he was living in affluence. He was living in abundance. So the way we live, 
our condition most times, our environment condition our perspective. As we go ahead, we'll begin to see them. But while reading this, it's necessary to, to also illustrate it. So he was, he was, he was determined to, to live a wasteful life, to live a wild life, because he was already in so much comfort. But he, he, he felt restricted. He felt he was training at a large. That's how the English man would say it. He wanted the freedom to, 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 to do whatever I like. That's why he propounded this theory and, 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 uh, and, and had this perspective. But by the time hunger started, his money ran out and he started to starve. We will see what the repercussion, the repercussion was to his perspective and to his worldview. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him. And the man sent him into the fields to feed the pigs. He told for now he has never done anything like that. He has never been hired. He has never looked for a job. He has never worked. The young man became so hungry, praise the Lord, that even the pods he was feeding, the pigs looked good to him. <laughs> Hunger, starving. If we come back here, you see, the money ran out, he was starving, and then here he was so hungry. So hungry, very hungry, was famished. Then all of a sudden, his perspective began to change. <laughs> and then something that you will give to him before and he will spit it out because he was living in comfort. As we are going to see that most of the, of the, of the, of the, of the um, worldview that reject anything that has to do with God, they are living in comfort. When you go to the East, when you go to Africa and those places where there is less comfort, people don't argue whether there is God or not. But when you go to the other side of the, of the world where people are comfortable, where people are living, they easily propound. Because as we can see from this story, when hunger came, his perspective began to change. When he finally came to his senses, this one is very important. When he finally came to his senses, that means though he had a perspective, though he was, he, he was making his own argument, though he was deciding what he wants to do, the Bible says when he came to his senses, so he was doing things outside of his senses. There are a lot of theories, there are a lot of, 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 of worldview that the people who made it were outside their senses. They were not in their, in their right mind. But when, 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 when hardship came, his perspective changed. And after a while, he came to his senses. Sometimes the people you are arguing with, you, you, instead of arguing with people, you just pray, let them come to their senses. I remember when I was still in, uh, in the university, I was doing diploma a lot then. A student came to my, uh, to my room and was preaching to me and I started talking nonsense. I said, then it was sense to me. The guy just looked at me, didn't argue with me. And he just told me, I will never forget. He said, Brajimo, you need the renewing of the mind. <laughs> and he got up and left. First of all, he called me a bro, and I was not a bro then. And the second of all, he was talking about renewing of the mind. I don't know what renewing of the mind is. Years later, when I got born again, that bright face stick up kept coming to my mind. Because he understood this kind of thing, that I was not in my senses. I was talking OP. It is useless arguing with me because as we as we will see, as we are going to see as we go ahead, why it is useless. He said to himself, when you come to your senses, you will advise yourself. And you will advise yourself. You, it's hard to advise yourself wrong when you are in your senses. At home, even the hired servants have food. Enough to spare. And here I am, dying of hunger. <laughs> I will go home to my father and say, Father, I have seen against both heaven and you. <laughs> Someone who is comfortable in his sin, in his iniquity, will never see that what he or she is doing is offending God or anybody. Will be full of themselves. And I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant so he returned home to his father and while he was still a long way away his father saw him coming did with love and compassion ah, glory to god 
You know, there are some people who say the God of the Old Testament is different from the God of the New Testament because they do not understand the love and compassion of God. That the only thing that matches the wrath of God is the love and the compassion of God. Now, in our culture, we will not understand what this man did here. Because after the Bible says, feed with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. In this culture, if a child does what this, this prodigal son did, as he is coming home and they see him, they will run towards him and break the pot in his, in his front, meaning you are rejected, you are no longer accepted here. And the whole community will make sure he doesn't get back home. So to avoid that, the father had to run to his son and embrace him so that somebody does not get there before him and break a pot in his, in his face. That is the compassion and the love of our God. Okay, so like we said before, we see the same thing. But we perceive things differently. And because we perceive things differently, we give different interpretations to things. So we'll look at the case of the scouts and Caleb in Numbers 13, verse 22 to 20, um, verse 32 to 33, and then 4, verse 1 to 4. Okay. The Bible says, But the people living there were powerful. Now, this is the report that they were, they were bringing after they went to scout for the, the promised land. And their towns are large and fortified. Who doesn't want to stay in a large and fortified uh, and town? We even saw giants there, the descendants of Anak and the Amalekites living in the Negrev, and the Hittites, the Jebusites and the Amorites live in the hill country. The Canaanites live along the coast of the Mediterranean Sea and along the Jonah, Jordan River. You see the things that are in the town, for large and fortified towns, giants are there, there are Malachi, there are people all there, there is, there is the Mediterranean Sea along that place where so you have beaches, okay, you also have the Jordan, the Jordan uh, Valley, you know, you have hills in the countries and so on and so forth. These are the beautiful, beautiful things that was in the land where they went to. He said, but Caleb tried to quiet the people as they stood before Moses. Let's go at once to take the land. He said, we can certainly conquer it. You see his perspective? He was looking at the same thing like the other people. And this was his own report. That we can certainly conquer it. Let's see the report of the other people. He said, but the other men, the other scouts, who had exploited the land with him, disagree. <laughs> we are back again to this issue of agreement and disagreement. In the former place, the father agreed, even though it's wrong to collect your father's wealth while he's alive. He agreed. But here the men disagreed. The first, the first example we looked at, the man agreed with his son who was wrong. But here the men disagreed with, the, with Caleb who was the one saying the right thing. Same God packed the Red Sea, brought water from the rock, turned bitter water to sweet, rained dinner for heaven. He was with them all the way for 40 years. We'll see what their report was, what they were looking at. We cannot go up against them. Now, this is their, their, their own perspective. This is their own uh, uh, perspective. This is their own worldview. We can't do it. Okay, what did they see that is making them to have this perspective? They are stronger than we are. So they spread this bad report. The Bible calls it a bad report. Can you wonder how many bad reports we listen to every day in mainstream media? How many bad reports the, 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 the news outlets are, are, are sharing all over the place, changing people's perspective? People see themselves as, we can't. We can't. They are stronger than we are. Like the picture of the Chinese child we saw, the first picture is what some me the media will tell us. So we are full of fear and full of uh, uh, insecurity. But by the time we are able to see the full picture, and we'll see how we can look at the full picture. Once we get that right and we are able to stick, you will see that uh, you will, we will have the same thing that Caleb had. We will have this we can mentality. We can conquer it mentality. So they spread this bad news about the land 
among the Israelites. The land will travel through and we explore, we devour us, <laughs> which is a sharp contrast to what we saw earlier. And what we saw earlier was the land was fortified. There was water, there was valley, there was every good thing. There were people living in it. But they are saying that same land of milk and honey we devour anyone who goes to live there. <laughs> All the people we saw were huge. Praise the Lord. Take note. They saw, they perceive, and then they form the world view around what they perceive. They saw people that were huge. David saw Goliath. Goliath was huge. But he didn't say Goliath would devour him. So what are they looking, both people looking at? The same thing. But why are they having different interpretation? We even saw giants there, the descendant of Anak. Next to them, we felt, hallelujah. If you miss anything, don't miss this one. Now, next to them, we felt, we felt like grasshoppers. Okay? Now they, 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 they saw that they were huge. Okay? They saw giants. They saw the descendants of Anak. They already made up their mind based on what they have seen that the land will devour them. And then they now confirm that they were like grasshopper. Even see, seeing themselves as a grasshopper is not even as bad enough. The last line says, and that is what they thought of too. <laughs> That's what they thought too. You know? People see other people like themselves. My mother used to tell me that a thief does not believe anybody. A liar does not believe anybody. Praise the Lord. If you want to know someone who is a good liar, he doesn't believe anybody because they are always lying. <laughs> so they see the liar that they are inside you. They can't trust you. They have trust issues. They go to ATM, withdraw money, and they count the money again. Praise the Lord. So they felt like grasshopper. So because they feel like grasshopper, they, as, they assume those other people were looking at them like grasshoppers. One day we were in class, and one lady was saying, if you have seven boyfriends and you have one, it's the same thing. <sighs> How can it be the same thing? What is the problem? Because she feels that way. She assuming everybody is that way. And of course, she's seeing everybody like that. So you tell such a girl that live clean, don't have sex before marriage, the person will be looking at you and seeing you the way she feels or the way she is. God will help us in Jesus' name. All right. Then the whole community began weeping aloud and they cried all night. Can you imagine? Why are they crying? They didn't see the giants. But just hearing that report has given them a perspective that make them to cry all night. The land have not devoured them. They are already crying. Their voice rose in a great chorus of protest against Moses and... Does this sound familiar? Does this sound a great chorus of what? Protest! <laughs> huh? Does this sound familiar at all? Against Moses and Aaron? Why? If only we had died in Egypt. Now, this Egypt, when they were in Egypt, they were what? They were slaves. And the Bible said that God heard their groaning. They were groaning. They, they, they have cried and cried and cried and cried that they didn't have voice to cry again. They were groaning while they were in Egypt. That's why God sent Moses to, 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 to redeem them. The Bible says, and God remembered his covenant with, with their forefathers. Now they have only heard the bad news. They feel like going back to this bad experience where they were groaning. Yeah. Or even here in the wilderness. See, they are making choices now. It's better to die in Egypt, in slavery, or die in wilderness as 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 an uh, how will i call it now as a scavenger they complain have you seen people who complain to complaining is a sign that you are looking at the wrong thing praise the lord 
I pray God will help us. There is no other explanation to complaining than you are looking, you are focusing on the wrong thing and it's giving you a wrong perspective. That is why you are complaining. Because thanks is talking to God or prayer is talking to God. Complaining is talking to the devil. Why is the Lord taking us to this country only to have us die in battle? Now take notice, they are blaming the Lord that came to save them in Egypt. As we begin to look at what view, we will see how the world views that we are propounded, we are all directed to attack God and the things of God. They started blaming God. I saw somebody put in his, uh, in his post one day. He said, which God are you praying to? Is it a God that caused the problem or God that refused to do anything about the problem? <laughs> I look at it and I shook my head. Perspective, world view. His only perspective about God is that he said that God is causing problem or God should come and solve the problem. So as far as he cannot see those two, <laughs> therefore, he doesn't see any reason why God does not exist. <laughs> Please, Lord. One told me, see the prayer you have been praying says, I've got answered. I've got answered because his perspective about prayer is asking. Once you someone is praying, it must be asking. Asking is not prayer. It's just a part of prayer. We have other aspects of prayers. There is supplication. There is intercession. There is exhortation. There is thanksgiving. All these are our prayers. So because you saw me pray yesterday and praying today, it doesn't mean I'm asking. It is your perspective. It's what you have decided to focus on. Our wives and our little ones will be carried off as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to return to Egypt? <laughs> then they plotted it among themselves. Let's choose a new leader <laughs> and go back to Egypt. So you see what they had? You see what the, if the, the perspective they form out of it? And then look at their corresponding action to go back to slavery that they were freed from. It is this kind of reaction that's, that's why perception is particularly important. With this kind of, of, of issue, that is why it is necessary for us to look at world views. So that not only to, to put other people in perspective, but to put ourselves in perspective. When you see yourself complaining, you'll be able to know at that time that you are focusing on the wrong thing. And look for the right thing to focus on. Just um, some Sundays ago, pastor was telling us about this story. A man was in his office, a skyscraper, it was very high, in a very high building. So as he was there by his office, he was looking through the window. And somebody ran into the office. I was shouting, hey, sir, 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 your son, Yakubu, your son, Yakubu has been eaten by crocodiles in the village. And as the man heard it, just as these people also heard it, the Israelite, he just panicked and jumped through the window. <laughs> as he was landing, as he was, as he was falling down from the skyscraper, that was when he realized, number one, he, he has three daughters and, and no son. So he doesn't have any son and none of his children is called Yakubu. And in his village, there are no crocodiles. Praise the Lord. <laughs> it's just like seeing that Chinese, uh, that Chinese child and then you carry placard and you start going to protest. It's when police will arrest you, you will know that uh, there are no Chinese in, in the country where you are protesting. And nothing like that happened. But before he could uh, round up his thinking, he had landed on the ground. Why? Perception. Based on what, on the input of what entered his ears and his eyes. So that's just for us to lay a foundation of what perspective is, just an introduction to it. So the, the objective, what we're going to do is take a chronological look. We want to look from, okay, when did all this started? And as it started, what were people considering? Who were the people who were considering these things? You know, and how has this impacted? What has this impacted that have that have led us up to this to this uh, place? All world views cannot be analyzed, so we are looking at the major ones. Okay. And the aim is to equip the saints against assaults of counter-perspective against our faith. 
if you are a Christian and you have not noticed that there are counter perspective, in short, I, I, I prefer to call it attacks. The Bible says since the days of John the Baptist, the kingdom of God advances by force, but the wicked one keeps attacking it. The attack against our faith, we need to be equipped enough to know what to do. So the plan, we're going to look at what world view is, the definition of world view. We'll just finish the introduction. Then we'll look at the impact. What does world view really impact? And then before we now take a step-by-step, you know, evaluation of the major world views, and then we'll wrap it up before we'll continue uh, next time. Okay, so what's world view? When we look at different definition, a world view is simply the total of our beliefs about the world, okay? The big picture that directs our daily decisions and activities. So you see, all of us, we go out, we make decisions, but are you conscious of your worldview? That's the first place to start from. What is your own worldview? What is directing your own perspective? Why do you do the things you do? Why do you participate in the activities you participate in? Why do you refuse to participate in some other activities? It all depends on your worldview. Okay? Worldviews are the lens. This is Ravi Zakaria's definition. Are the lens through which we receive, we conceive all of reality. So what view forms our reality? The paradigm for which everything actually emerges. Little narrative become the reality of the bigger picture. So here we talk about big picture. But here he's making us understand that the little, little uh, things, narratives that we hear every day that we put together is what form our big picture of our life itself. So our life is ultimately directed. You can see the decision that the Israelites made. You can see their decision based on just a small information that entered into their ears. That information went into their hearts, okay, and then gave them that narrative now, gave them the bigger picture, which now make them to act based on what they think their reality is. Only God knows who told the prodigal son that he should go and live a, a wasteful life. So, what was the impact? Now, when these little narratives have entered into us and have formed a worldview, I will not perceive things in a special way. I will not look, see things. Our reality is so formed by all this. What is, what is impacted is culture. And what is culture? Culture is an effort to find a coherent set of answers to the existential questions that confront all of us in the passage of our lives. <laughs> Praise the Lord. You know, there was a stage in my life where I was feeling like there's no hell, there's no heaven. You know, life is just... Uh, there was a time, self I felt I, I came to the world before, you know, I had uh, how many wife and how many children. And I was just imagining things and saying all these things. Okay. There was a time I was, I was telling myself, once you die, you get rotten, and that's the end of life. But... What was I trying to escape? The issue with that, we'll see as, as time goes on, that when you start saying things like that, death becomes irrelevant. There is no significance of dying. Because if all we just need to do is to come to this life, eat, sleep, shit, and then die, and that's the end, then what's the essence of death? There will be no need to die. So die, death will not have a significance with such a worldview. So I wanted to escape the reality of life after death. So I kept propounding theories even when I have not heard it from anybody. So when I started learning this worldview and I started seeing people propounding this thing, kind of theory, you know, emphasizing this kind of things, I started, I started laughing because I want to escape reality. So right now, the problem now, this is where the, 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 we need this topic, is that cultures are interacting. Praise the Lord. I am with an African in my class, but she's from Egypt. You know, where the, the other one is from East Africa. So every the rest are from Asia, different places. So we interact. So every day in the place of business, in the place in the office, 
different culture, people from different backgrounds, people who have had different narratives, you know, who have formed their own idea about what reality is. They come together, they interact, they meet every day, and then they have contact with each other. And what does that lead to? That leads to a battle, a secret battle. Something like accent. Which is the correct accent to use? Is it American accent? Is it British accent? Is it East Africa accent? Is it West Africa accent? That one alone, there is already a conflict. And what is the conflict to, uh, about? It's about dominance. It's about dominance. And when we have dom this culture trying to dominate this culture, this culture trying to de 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 dominate this culture, it results to cancel culture and shift culture. So one culture is going to cancel the other culture and impose their own ways of seeing things to them. Or on the other hand, some people will neglect their own culture to accept other cultures. Does it surprise you that Africans are born in Africa and can't speak their mother language? Praise the Lord. What is happening? Culture shift. Eh? Cancel culture. When you go to look for a job in Africa, nobody says speaking an African language is an added advantage. But when you go, you will hear speaking a European language, uh, one or two, is an added advantage. So with things like that, there's already a cultural dominance and we are experiencing council culture and cultural shift because of the uh, conflict between two cultures. Okay, so the impact of worldview, it is the battle between one what one believes to be true and what the other person believes to be true. Okay, so that conflict and dominance is an issue of truth. The conflict arises that arises is uh, addresses the issue of truth and dominance. So what we now see is that the popular, the more influential, the more accepted, the more attractive, the more confident side against the less popular, the less accepted side. Uh, this is saying that uh, Christianity have not been tried and found wanting. Rather, it has been found difficult and left untried. And left untried. Up to today, I have people who are still pushing the African narrative and all they are pushing the African narrative is they want to marry more than one wife. It's convenient. It's attractive. You know, they want to be promiscuous. So if you put a culture that says one man, one wife here, and you put one that says marry as many as you like, more people will care to waste the one that is allowing you marry and live however you like. So as this conflict begins to happen, truth and dominance becomes the standard issue. And the one that is more attractive, the one that is more convenient, the one that appeals more to the self and the, and the natural man begin to gain side over the less popular and the less uh, op uh, operational uh, culture. What we need to know on cultural dominance is that God does not, uh, does not follow crowd. God does not follow crowd. Look at Gideon. A, 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 a war that takes a whole nation to fight. Gideon used only 300 men. In the days of Noah, everybody, the dominant culture that was more attractive, we are against only him and his family. I believe some of his family members will even grumble. Why do I say that? Because of Lot. Even when Lot's wife was running, her heart was still in the, in the city and the thing she's leaving behind. So I believe that some of the family members might be grumbling. When they were following him and at this time the 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 weather forecasters there and the people who are experts in in rain and land and the way the earth is we make a mockery of him we scold him the 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 the, the, the tv stations and the network news are then we make a caricature of him and let him know that he's wasting his time he's fooling himself and that took thing took him Yes, I think 200 years or thereabouts to build. So imagine how many years he was facing such monkery, such opposition. But the truth is, God does not follow the crowd. Look at the apostles. I was reading about the apostles. And the Bible says the apostles turned the world upside down. However, when you read the 
people among the apostles who turned the world upside down was not the twelve. You know, it was Peter, Paul, then maybe Stevie. They had these two people and then Philip. Yeah. About three, three four, four or five of them who God really used. Yeah, the Bible said they turned the world upside down. So God does not follow crowd and we have to be careful. So now we are getting to the crux of the issue. We are going to look at the different uh, 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 major worldviews and how they started and how they evolved over time. As God will help us. Okay, so we start with the Renaissance. Sorry, it's on the 14th, 16th, and um, the 14th, 15th, and the 16th century. The Renaissance came out. They, these people were, were. So sometimes you thank God why God made you study some courses as time goes on. Because uh, these things, I studied them you know, in literature and I was, I'm able to get a, a very good understanding. Because the Renaissance, they were a movement, they were poets, they were, they were, they were designers, mm, writers, they were painters, and all that. And the Renaissance was a, was a deliberate move. It was a movement from Christianity and towards humanism. Okay? So the shift is a paradigm shift that we are going to see from Christianity. Christianity point people to God. But they turn the attention and turn it back to man. That's the idea of the humanism. Praise the Lord. So the focus, the perspective, the worldview move from Christianity to what we and take note as at this time there were other religions but the movement there are no movements that were propounded that were established specifically to turn away from those religions but only Christianity and we will see as we go on okay so for them instead of measuring yourself by the standard of the word of God instead of Measuring yourself by what Christ has done for you, you measure yourself by yourself. You know, there's an authoritarian stance, it's self referencing, and it is shown in the act, it's just shown in literatures. And their emphasis is on the temporal. So when you say something is temporal, you're talking about this world as opposed to spiritual affairs. And that's where the word secular comes in. I heard a pastor say one day that when you say secular, it means without God. And he was correct. This was the idea with the Renaissance. And the other thing that they also emphasized is personnel. That means to yourself rather than to someone else. So when you are talking about Jesus dying for you, they are talking about you. Fair as you do for too long a look touch. You doing your own tax and Cultivate, there's another one that says cultivate votre jardin, meaning um, they were French, most of them were French uh, 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 philosophers and poets. So I studied them in school, and uh, it's what this, most of them said that I'm, I'm saying now. So we say, cultivate your own garden. So you are saying Jesus died for you, you just died for you, or this or that, or God, you do your own thing by your own self. What they are saying makes sense, but we'll see. That, that we will look into all that uh, in the in the next distance. So we have people like Leonardo da Vinci, Giovanni, Boccaccio, Donatello, and so on and so forth. This Molière too was a French writer, great French writer, so on and so forth. So let's see what the Bible says in the book of Jeremiah concerning something like this. This is what the Lord says: "Cause is the one." Who trusts in man? Who trusts strength from mere flesh? And whose heart turned away from God? Praise the Lord. And that's what happened. Okay? So they preach humanism, they preach individualism, they preach skepticism, they speak, uh, uh, they, they preach secularism, and it was reflecting in every area of, of their life. One thing we must know is that nothing under the sun is new. Nothing other this one is new. I hear people every day say, eh, I don't follow any religion anymore. I follow my own code. You are not following your own code. That code you are saying is your own. You heard it from somebody, you accepted it, and you make it your own. Just the way the Israelites heard the negative news, they made it their own and they acted upon it. 
So if you think otherwise, you are falling into the trap of what I call make-believe. And that's what the devil does. If you look at the devil from the, from, 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 from the garden of uh, Eden till now, he has a way of making people believe they are in charge or he make people believe that he does not exist. And that's what is happening in all this. Okay. Somebody said one day, he said, I am fool for Christ. <laughs> Whose fool are you? And I hear people say, I'm nobody's fool. And I say, you are lying. You don't know. <laughs> you don't know that you are somebody's fool, but you are somebody's fool. This thing you are saying, I heard one guy saying one time that uh, uh, popular culture, popular culture make us feel that uh, fake humility. But for me, I follow my code. I say, keep quiet. This your code that you are saying is a culture too. Don't think uh, it is. it fell from heaven and entered your head. It is a culture. People have lived by this standard and this principle before it got to you. So we move to the 17th century. The 17th century was known as the age of reasoning. Underline that word reasoning. Because our, 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 our generation. So it was the introduction of mathematical method into philosophy. So things had to follow mathematics. Okay. So their practice was based on intellectual and deductive reasoning. So they rejected anything that has to do with your senses or your experience or your religious teaching. Hey, does this mean, does, 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 this, does this ring a bell? Because by rejecting religious teaching and rejecting experience, because you don't know God by intellectual analysis. You don't know God by deductive reasoning and you don't know God by mathematical method. You know God by an encounter, by divine revelation. So this is what they are rejecting. They are rejecting anything that has to do with your senses. They are rejecting anything that has to do with your experience. And they are rejecting anything that you say that has to do with, with what God has revealed or said to you. So we have people like Reno Descartes. Reno Descartes himself was called the father of modern philosophy. And Reno Descartes was the one who said, I think, therefore I am. He was the one who gave this realistic view of life to the core. And when I see preachers preach and say, think more than you pray, I just laugh. What you are saying, when you say someone should think more than he prays, you are saying the person should be more rational than spiritual. It might sound good, but at the end, as we begin to look at these this, uh, worldviews, you will see how this kind of thing limited people and the move of God. As a matter of fact, let us just go ahead. Okay, as such, mathematics became the only setting science. So like we said before, it's an issue of dominance. So before the Renaissance came in, there were people who were humanistic. But by then, the humanistic ideology was not dominating. Before uh, uh, Descartes came to, to, to life, people has been reasoning. But that was not the dominant culture. So this is an issue of dominance and truth. This is what the Bible says. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you which paths to take. Don't be impressed with your own wisdom. Instead, fear the Lord and turn away from evil. As we go ahead, you will see that all the school of thought that dominated was manipulated by those who were educated. From life in memoria, those who go to school, that's why they talk about the ivory tower has been the one telling us what is good or what is not good. How about the illiterates? How about the farmers? How about the fishermen? Don't they have their own reality? Don't they have their own philosophy? Praise the Lord. So when the Bible is asking you not to lean on your understanding, he understands that those people who understand, those people who have wisdom, those people who are enlightened, they are the ones who propound the dominant uh, 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 philosophy. So the issue now is that we moved from God and we moved to literature, okay? Or we moved from, from things of God to literature and from literature, we landed 
That is to say, we move from focusing on God to focusing on ourselves. Now we are moving from focusing to our, on ourselves to thinking, thinking for ourselves. And then in the 18th century came the empirical movement, school of thoughts. At this time, we are talking about the age of enlightenment. <clears throat> Here, man, man became an empirical being. Where the only thing you can be setting off is what happened in the laboratory. It's a, it was all about subjecting things to scientific testing. The emphasis was on evidence and direct observation. They relies on they rely on inductive instead of deductive reasoning. Okay, so what's in that, uh, inductive reasoning? It simply means giving a <coughs> making a broad uh, generalization from specific observation. Okay, so in this place we talk about data. You have data, something you can count. Then based on that, you will make your conclusion. But a lot of us are doing our, <laughs> we are doing our, um, what do you call it now? Our uh, graduate studies. And you know how easy it is to manipulate data. Praise the Lord. However, if, even if all of, uh, all of the premises are true in a statement, inductive reasoning allows for the conclusion to be what? To be false. You see the confusion. Praise the Lord. But this is what became dominant in the 18th century. Okay? So you have people like David Hume, John Locke, and Bickley. And this is what David Hume said. Kai, you need to listen to this statement. If we take in our hands any volume of divinity, he's talking to you now as a Christian, or school metaphysics, for instance, let us ask, does it contain any abstract reasoning concerning quantity and number? No. Does it contain any experimental reasoning concerning matter of fact and existence? No. Then what do you do? Commit it then to the flames. Burn it. He said you go and burn your Bible. For it can contain nothing but sophistry and illusion. So when, 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 when God reveals himself to a prophet, to them that's illusion. But where is the problem in this statement? See the problem now. So what he is saying now is that everything that must be truth must be mathematical or scientific. So anything that must be truth can be counted. Anything that must be truth can be subjected to laboratory. Anything that is true can be observed with your physical uh, uh, mind and all that. But the problem is that this is statement itself was neither scientific or mathematical. So if we should follow his own statement, his own statement will be committed to the flame first before any other thing. So by next week, we'll be looking at the fact that one of the things we'll look at is anything we use to test God must be subject to testing itself. So if you are saying we must use, it, we must use um, science and mathematics to, 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 to decide what is true, then Science and mathematics themselves have to be put to test. Okay? This what we call the truth test, and they are the principles of testing truth. So, if his own statement is to be tested by mathematics and science, this statement contains nothing mathematical or, science or, or scientific. So, his own statement should be thrown into the flame. Okay, so this is my thinking. This is my thinking, so I'm going to read it. Anything you use to test God, like I said before, or the existence of God itself need to be put to test. So with logic, you can prove that there is God. And with logic, you can prove that there is no God. However, what is logic? And this is my de definition. Logic is the wisdom and the foolishness of man. And what does the Bible say? The foolishness of God is wiser than the wisdom of man. So if the foolishness of God is wiser than both the wisdom and the foolishness of man, how do we use the wisdom and the foolishness of man to detect? the existence and prove or test God. That's the fallacy of it doesn't follow. If we say there is no God because we cannot see God, then there is no air because we cannot see air. And this is what we, where I stand. If a blind man says the color does not exist, and then he shows you color pencils and tells you that colors are man-made, 
what is the solution to that man's problem? Like we saw in the Bible in the case of, uh, of, of the Israelite. Argument is not the issue. What the blind man needs is sight. If you are following a blind man to argue that color exists and he has been blind all his life, you will argue from today to tomorrow. You are pursuing the shadow. Because if you, can, if you can get to the wound, you can stop the bleeding. So the issue is not the bleeding, the issue is the wound. So arguing with a blind man that color exists is of no use because the problem is not the color or the existence of the color, but the problem is the, is, is the sight. So what he needs is the sight. So that's why we cannot begin to argue with people like this. Because in blindness they are blind, and even hearing they can't hear. So you cannot continue to argue because of their foolishness. What they need is the renewing of the mind. And as soon as their minds are renewed, they will know that there is God. I heard the rapper said once that I talk to God and he doesn't say anything back. And I say, how will he say anything back when your heart is full with every form of iniquity? And even if God speaks back, you won't hear because your heart is too hard. If you can feel air, you can also feel God who made her. But when your conscience is snared and you have no encounter, no relationship with God, you will not be able to perceive God and you will say God does not exist. Such people need the renewing of the mind. They need an encounter. They need salvation experience. You see, salvation is an experience. It's an encounter. It's not a mental concept. But what we have been seeing since are people saying that you need mental consent to be able to prove salvation experience, which is putting the tax before the horse. And there will be no movement if you do that. They don't need arguments. Arguing with such people is a waste, a waste of time and a waste of grace. Because no matter how much you argue with a blind man, the argument is not going to make them see. They are going to remain blind. Let's look at what Corinthian, 1 Corinthians says. For the Jews require sign, and the Greeks, they seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. And what is, the, what is that to other people? Under the Jews, a stumbling block. Why? Because the mind of a Jewish man is science and wonder. That's all he has heard. He heard about how God delivered his first father from, 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 from Egypt. He heard about them, uh, how the God kept them 40 days and 40 nights. How God helped them to, to turn uh, rock to water and all that. So a Jewish man has heard so much things that God has done for them. And all they want to see is a miraculous sign. So Christ becomes a stumbling block. And not all the Greek foolishness. Because the Greek is all about philosophy. So all the things we are studying in, in school are linked to the Greek philosophers. Why? Having only one God came from the Jews. But them, which are called, you see that? You see that they, they were denying, they were saying anything that has to do with experience. But the called ones are not called by, by mathematical statistics. They are called by their encounter and it's a, a divine experience. Both Greeks and Jews, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. See that? When you talk about power, you are talking about science, science that the Jews are looking for. When you talk about wisdom of God, you are talking about intellect, wisdom that the Greeks are looking for. So the Jews are looking for sign. The Greeks are looking for wisdom. Both of them are in Christ Jesus. But the Greeks and the Jews who we assess the power and the wisdom of God are those who are called. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. So from, 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 from God to literature, from literature to mathematics, from mathematics to the lab, which translates to from referencing to God to referencing to self, their man became the measurement to thinking for yourself, to rational measurement, to empirical measurement, and then naturalism was just in the corner waiting to step in. Like we said before, this is an issue of truth and dominance. Okay? This is what perception is. When you have education, you move from faith 
to what? To rationalism. When you are rich, you move from God to your possession. When you are good looking, you move from God to self. When you are powerful, you move from God to arrogance. Nothing is new. So all what we have been looking for, talking about, this is it. You remember the prodigal son we talked about? He moved from what? From his father's house to living alone and living a royal child's life. Why? Because he had the power of money. He had money. He was rich. So he moved from the cover of his father and went to his possession and was spending his possession. But it's a matter of time before the possession were, was exhausted. And then in the 19th century, we went to skepticism. Then you have Immanuel Kant. Immanuel Kant himself was, was influenced by David Hume. And ultimately, he just moved from whatever Hume was saying to becoming a, a total skeptic. Kant acknowledged empirical science but rejects the possibility of metaphysical uh, knowledge. For him, you cannot be certain of any metaphysical pronouncement. So you cannot be certain of word of knowledge. You cannot be certain of prophecy. We start off things like ethics. So now we are now moving to making our own, our own laws and our own rules. Ethics and morality that can be known by pure reasoning. You see that? So by the time we got to this stage, what happened was that God himself was evicted from the, from the equation, from the whole equation, which he himself is the author of. Now, this is very important, okay? This is very important because this is what separates the Western culture today from every other culture. I want us to take note of that. So, by the 20th century, we had liberal theologians. This is another very important thing. So when you see some Christians denying some things, this is how the journey started. So it is from the 20th century we started having liberal theologians who just have a mental concept to the things of God. But anything divine, anything supernatural, they deny it. They were reigning supreme in the seminaries. God's word was no longer treated with any kind of authority. Because to talk to about God, you cannot be certain in any sense whatever. You can put God into a laptop. You can observe God. You can't analyze God. There is no data to prove. Therefore, you can really not talk about God to anybody. Man became a skeptical being because there was no basis for measurements. What has happened? We have lost every sense of, measure, of, 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 of measurement. Then, existentialism was waiting to be born. Like in the book of Ecclesiastics, as we look at the book as uh, existentialist, you will see that when the Bible says vanity upon vanity, I, I, the guy, the, the, the guy writing the book of uh, Ecclesiastics, he gained knowledge, he gained money, he gained power, he gained everything. But at the end of the day, he said vanity upon vanity equals vanity. So th there was an experience I had with a guy. So I just got born again, hot and all that. So my friends just called somebody, one of their neighbor, who was also a skeptic, and called him to come and argue with me about God. And the guy came in, and as he was about to start talking, I just said, okay, hold on. I didn't know anything about, about uh, worldview then, but I was just led. So I said, okay, from where are you speaking from? He said, from natural reason. So I said, what is natural reason? I said, well, so in other words, you are speaking by Sight. He said, yes, but what you can see, what you can feel, what you can observe. I said, me, I'm speaking by faith. So there is no basis for me and you to discuss. All right? I said, well, I just prayed for him. I said, thank you. You can go. There's no time to waste with you. So we now move to the 20th century. So the 20th century, passion, the will, the emotion, was just watching from the stand, looking at this game being played, and waiting for its own time to dominate and provide the center point of truth and sanctity. And there was no inherent meaning. Nothing has meaning under the existentialism. Nothing has meaning. Something is only meaningful because of you. It is meaningful to you. So it can be meaningful to you and not be meaningful for me. So nothing has meaning. So in other words, the world became meaningless. This is where people can just tell you, uh, we're just here, we hustle our hustle, we die, and then it's, the, it's over. Why? Because the world has no meaning. 
What you do have no meaning. What happens to you have no meaning. Death has no significance. But you have freedom, despite the, that the world is meaningless, you still have the freedom and the duty to place meaning in anything you want. So everybody is on their own. What is in, what is in jeopardy here? Absolute truth. So what the existentialist now did, since we have said reason, data, and this and that, mathematical, uh, whatever, to determine what is truth, they have come to the stage where they say, no, nothing is truth. You can't be certain about anything. You can't be certain about data. You can't be certain about mathematics. You can't be certain about your own reasoning. You can't be certain about the word of the Lord. You can't be certain about anything anymore. But it is your own responsibility to choose whatever you think is, is the law. So that is where you have people like Abad Camus and Jean Paul Sartre. Jean Paul Sartre was the author of Kerskola Literature. So this, they were very brilliant, extremely brilliant people when you read their books, okay? And they philosophize with stories. They philosophize with stories. They didn't philosophize with uh, uh, data or a lot of analysis. And what happened was that people started seeing themselves in their stories, okay? So like I said before, the elites, the intellectual elites, those at the, at the universities have hijacked the concept of truth for a long time, okay? And this is the reason why we talk about the ivory tower, okay? So people identified with their, with their story, people saw themselves in their stories, and these stories were designed to mock people who have faith, people who pray, okay? And people who, who are waiting on God. There was one that said that, before God answer you, answer you, answer all of you that are praying, I will go there and do the thing and get the thing myself. It's also lack of, of, of understanding of the word of God. And this is what John Possard said. He said, man is nothing else but what he makes of himself. And Albert Camus said, the only way to deal with an unfree world is to become so absolutely free that your very existence is an act of rebellion. <laughs> what does the Bible say? Yes, the new God. That's where we started from. Before the 13th century, we knew God. But they wouldn't worship him as God or even give him thanks. And they began to think up foolish ideas of what God was like. As a result, their minds became dark and confused. I mean, there's no other way to explain the fact that we started from somewhere and now nothing is truth. Nothing is real. Nothing is, is because you say it is real that it is real. Because you say it is truth, it is the truth. And verse 22 says, claiming to be wise, they instead became utter fools. They didn't just become fools. They became utter fools. And then, in the mid 20th century to the late 20th century, we had postmodernism. Truth and meaning here was culturally based. It is shaped by your personal experience, your social class your gender, your culture, your religion, whatever. They deny the existence of universal truth and meaning. Now, when we say universal truth, we're talking about absolute truth. And when we say absolute truth, we are referring to what God says, like the Ten Commandments. That is absolute truth. Apostle Paul says, against this, there is no law. So they say no. That's what they are saying. No, there is nothing as absolute truth. So if you try to bring an absolute truth as it tosses the law, they see it as an imperial effort to marginalize and oppress people of their rights. <laughs> I was talking to one of my classmates who is, who is listening to these people and, and taking their sides. And, you, and I, I, I sent him a message, so a, a missionary who went to a, 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 a village and, you know, God used him. And he said that the guy should be arrested for imposing a culture that does not belong to these people on them. These were people who were walking naked because they were told that there is a demon that, that, that will kill them if they wear clothes. So everybody was stuck naked in the village. He went there, broke the course, and then they started wearing clothes. He said they, they, the man should be arrested. Why? Because of his effort to marginalize and oppress others. He's oppressing people. The people should be walking around naked. They reject, they reject any single definition, source of truth. 
and meaning. And the only single source of truth. Truth is not an idea. Truth is a person. So when you reject truth, you reject Christ. It's as simple as that. The emphasis is on difference. Plurality. Eh? Selective forms of tolerance. So when you hear a lot of people trying to explain some certain ungodly laws and saying that you are intolerant, this is how far we are following. This is how far we are following. It's not the author who tells you at this stage, we talk about Nouveau Roman. It is not the author who tells you what he has written. It is you that reads it and then decide what you want the author to say. Okay, so we have moved now from objective observation of fact to the leader who sits in authority and determine what is meaningful or not. So we have people like Jean Francois, Frederick Jameson, and so on and so forth. So this is what Jean Francois said. He says, simplifying to the extreme, I define postmodernism as incredulity towards meta narratives. Meta, meta narrative, different narrative. So it's an alloy of ideas all mixed together. So what is very critical here? Such thinking has separated the East from the West, like I said before. It has separated the East from the West. It will separate Africa from the West. So all over the West, you have this, this individualistic personal, personal definition to what is accepted, what is not accepted. But the issue now is that those who are more popular, who are more powerful, wants to dominate at the same time which is the problem with postmodernism in the first place. So absolute truth, that is the truth that comes from God, has been displaced, but nothing to replace it. So right now, in the Western world, nothing is true, nothing is false. All we have is fact and no complete truth. But postmodern thinking is full of contradiction. We're going to see the contradiction, the consistency that are in it. Okay? For example, the worldview say there is no worldview. Postmodernism is what? It's a worldview. But they say there is no worldview. So how can you be a worldview and say there is no worldview at the same time? Contradictions. Okay? It is an anti-theory. But it uses theory, you understand, to prove whatever it wants to prove. So what they do is that they attack every other theory. But to attack every other theory, they have to make their own theory. So how can you attack theory with a theory and deny that theory exists? Okay? It demands an imposed uniformity. Okay? In an effort to resist uniformity. <laughs> so why they are saying there is no absolute truth, in the process of trying to attack truth, they try to come together and impose a uniform idea. For example, there is no truth. So everybody has to come together and accept that there is no truth to counter absolute truth. So how do you impose uniformity just to destroy uniformity? It's like a cancer destroying itself. It employs propositional statement to negate truth based on propositional statement. <laughs> May God help us in Jesus' name. So let me wrap this up. Like we said before, it's a battle of dominance. And the issue for us is to, for us to now begin to realize to what degree of certainty can we affirm our faith? Well, when faith is being attacked from all sides, I don't need to overemphasize the way faith is being attacked from all sides. We will see now, from the empirical side, it's being attacked as something that is not measurable. It cannot be quantified. From rationality side, it does not fit into mathematics. Okay? But existentially, we are attacked with stories that make it seem that we need faith because we are vulnerable. That was what one, somebody told me. He said, I, I accepted Jesus Christ and became a Christian because I was vulnerable. And why he was saying it, it dawned on me that he's not even realizing that he's, he's even telling me why I received Christ, making him arrogant. So he's, he, he visualized, you know, he imagined. And as we are looking, anything that has to do with imagination should be thrown away. 
when we were looking at the different uh, uh, this thing just now. So he's trying to be a rational and a pragmatic person, but he's imagining that I was vulnerable, that's why I accepted Christ. But he's not imagining that he's arrogant, that's why he has the right to tell me why I accepted Christ. So they see you as someone who is less sophisticated. So the question now for us is, how do we impact someone who sees us as inferior to them? Though they say they are fighting justice and all that, but they look down on you when you talk about God. So with this kind of attack, where do we stand as Christians? So we are going to look at what we need to know about this worldview and other religious worldview, and then how to validate Christianity by putting it through the truth test. We're going to see what is in Christianity. What does Christianity offer? Where is the evidence of Christianity based on the test of truth? And to see if Christianity passes it. And if Christianity passes it, we will see how other worldview and even religious worldview falters and fail in this area. And then we will have to hold our Christianity more seriously. You know, I, 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 am, I am very confident that anybody who is just a Christian because their parents are Christians or because they have, they like the environment and they have a head knowledge will not survive. Until you have a, an encounter and a steady relationship with the person of the Holy Spirit, you are, you are going to fumble. You are going to fumble. And I pray that God will help us when next we meet. In Jesus' name, 